I want to begin with the joint statement that you that was issued uh, on the occasion of your meeting with President Biden earlier this week. I want to quote one line in particular. The war in Ukraine has a negative impact on the Indo-Pacific region. And just to begin, I would love to hear your explanation as to why that's so and how. What, 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 what specifically are you alluding to there? It impacts the Asia-Pacific area at many levels. First of all, it's damaged the international framework for law and order and peace between countries. It, it violates the UN Charter. It endangers the independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of all countries, especially small ones. And if a principle is accepted that crazy decisions and historical errors are the justification for invading somebody else, I think many of us are going to be feeling very insecure in the Asia Pacific, but also in the rest of the world. Secondly, because of what has happened and the rent in relations in Europe between developed countries and Russia, the global system of multilateral working together, whether on trade, whether on climate change, whether on pandemic preparedness, whether on nuclear non-proliferation, has become very difficult to work. You no longer have a framework in which opponents, um, rivals, competitors work together and uh, maybe disagree with one another, but there is a way in which we can do win-win cooperation. Now it's win-lose. You want the other guy to be down. Fix him. Crash his economy. So how then do most of the countries, if possible, hang together and cooperate with one another and not fall into disorder, autarky or anarchy? That's a big worry for us in Singapore because we depend on globalization to make a living. Thirdly, what happens in Ukraine is bound to have a big impact on U.S.-China relations. Uh, it will strain them. It has already strained them. You hope that with contacts between President Biden and President Xi at the highest level, uh, rational calculations will be made, and the relations will hold. In other words, not become worse than they already are. But you don't know, despite the best efforts on both sides. And if relations between the US and China worsen, that, that has a big implication for the whole of Asia Pacific and the world. Then there are the country specific responses to what's going to happen in Ukraine. Every country is now going to ask, what lesson does this hold for me in terms of my defense? in terms of whom can I, can I trust to come to my help when I need it. And it can see, particularly in Northeast Asia, uh, Mr. Abe in Japan saying, we should think about hosting US nuclear weapons. And I mean, I'm sure the Japanese have, some Japanese involved in strategic issues have been thinking these thoughts before but now Mr. Abe has put it on the table. The government, of course, has said, no, we will never do that. But the thought is planted. And it will not go away because the implication from Ukraine is that nuclear deterrence is something which is, can be very valuable. Uh, I think South Korea also, if you read the opinion polls, have a majority of the population who believe that uh, the country should develop some kind of nuclear capability. Not just host American weapons, which it used to do, but some kind of its own nuclear capability. So if it goes in that direction, you can, if you're an optimist, you'll say now North Korea has it, South Korea has it, Japan has it, PRC has it. 
and we have a stable equilibrium. <laughs> and if Iran has it, and Turkey, and Saudi Arabia, and some other Middle Eastern countries, you have an even bigger equilibrium, and you hope it's still stable. But I think we're heading into very dangerous directions. Then in terms of who's going to come to your help, I think calculations are going to be made. The, the framework in Asia Pacific is different from the framework in Europe. In Europe, you've got NATO, you've got Article 5, you've got um, the former Warsaw Pact countries, the former Soviet Union republics. And so the context as to where the lines are drawn, where the red lines are, is different. In Asia, you don't have that, but you have Taiwan, you have a one-China policy. You have a Taiwan Relations Act on the US side. But between the US and China, you have three joint communiques. What does this mean for how these structures will be interpreted, how things move? I think if you look at what's happening in Taiwan, um, in terms of their own defenses, they are now talking about pushing their draft national service from four months to 12 months. I don't think it's going to happen because it's not so easy just to call up everybody for that much longer, but at least that's a public mood at the moment. And there was a poll on Taiwanese opinion as to whether they have confidence which country will come to the help should the situation arise. And it's now at the point where 40% believe that the Japanese will come to their help, and 30% or about one third think that the Americans will come to their help. And in October last year, it was two thirds believing that the Americans would come to their help. So I think these calculations will be made. It will not change the scene overnight, but all these are uh, significant strategic recalibrations. I think beyond the response to the immediate situation in Ukraine, we should also think in the Asia Pacific about the path into conflict and how it can be avoided. What structures can you build? What processes? What uh, engagements? What strategic accommodations can be made in order to head off such a failure of deterrence and then you are into a defense situation? Uh, in, in Europe, there's a big debate, or amongst academics anyway, between the realists like John Meersheimer, who says if NATO had not expanded into East Asia, uh, East, Eastern Europe, then this would not have happened. And those who said, well, this would have happened anyway, is just as well. You've now got Poland and the Baltics inside NATO. In Asia, you don't have NATO, but we do have hot spots. We do have issues which are difficult to resolve. And we do need institutions which will bring in countries on both sides, rivals, and engage the US, engage China, engage countries which are closer to one or the other, and enable an adjustment which is very difficult to make, which is how to accommodate a China which is going to become more developed, larger, more advanced in the technology, and yet not become overbearing on the rest of the world and acceptable to the US, which currently is the dominant military power worldwide. And you've got to move in that direction. We have APEC. It's very helpful. It's focused on economic issues. We have the East Asia Summit, which brings all the participants in and talks about strategic issues. But um, it doesn't go a lot beyond that into substantive implementation. And now the US talks about the Indo-Pacific economic framework as a way to engage the region, and not just on a strategic or, or security and potentially hostile basis, but on a win-win basis. And I think you need to have give thought to this and steer things in a direction which does not lead you to a hot conflict. 